today's topic, which is where do I start with lean? Where do we start from lean? Like, what are some of the tricks of the trade for actually getting a culture of continuous improvement going in your company? You know, and maybe you've tried it in the past and hasn't been successful, right? Uh, so not necessarily starting from scratch, but how do you revamp? How do you make it really work? And I have some experience with other companies I've worked with, and I thought I'd share a few of those with you today. Um, you know, take some notes. Hopefully there's some things that come up that are new to you, or at least to re remind you of how you might go about it. If you have your own experience, one of the things we really value from this class is we have a lot of smart people in the room that also have great experience, just like me. I'd love to hear your input and ideas as well, and we can add that and learn as a group. Background on me, I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, MBA, I'm also an electrical engineer by trade, but I spent uh, the last 15 to 20 years working with companies to implement process improvement, continuous improvement, lean, however you want to call it. So our goal today, we want to learn a few things. How, how do we really get our employees engaged? How do we create an actual culture of continuous improvement? And how do we do that quickly without making uh, mistakes that are commonly made when companies try to do continuous improvement or lean? Who is this? Uh, session for who really would benefit from this and I, I don't think it's people that are just brand new to lean right it's probably for those of us that have tried to implement lean uh, or lean principles in our organization and have struggled to get it, get them adopted or to get people to really uh, use them and, and get the benefit that we all know can come from quick test just since we're not recapping what lean is uh, how about some feedback just a quick test how are, what is lean what does it mean to you when somebody says we're, we're going to try to do lean in our organization Based elimination. Eliminating waste. <coughs> Perfect. That's absolutely the you know typically the number one thing people think of, and that's absolutely right. Anything else comes to mind? Yes. Just to improve efficiency overall. Yeah. Anything that you can do to improve efficiency would be considered part of a lean program, initiative, culture, and so on. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Yes. I'm. I don't know what lean is, but now I'm a little bit about it. Okay. I'm totally new. Totally new, awesome. Okay, this is great because a lot of times we have people that have come in, they've got a lot of background, so I'll touch, I'll make sure and touch base on a little bit of what lean actually is and, and kind of bring you in as much as I can. Perfect. Um, I don't know if it, this, this really summarizes what you just said, right? This is, this is really what lean's all about. It's just fixing problems, right? And it's fixing problems and, and taking the time to fix them. A lot of times we just get so busy, it's like, oh my gosh, we, we don't have time to do anything strategic. We're just firefighting. Um, but if we don't, then it's, it's pretty obvious looking at this, like, oh, well, if they just stop and make things improve the process, then they wouldn't be working so hard. And that's really the struggle. Jim says value-added activities. Value-added activities. Yes, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, value-added activities. So in exchanging the work we do that is uh, not value-added, or the waste, and replacing it with value-added work. And value-added is determined by who, Jim? Who gets to decide that? I'm going to ask a question, see how fast you can type me back. <laughs> so typically, value add is in the eyes of the customer, right? So yeah. whoever we're That's serving. Yeah. I knew he would. I knew he had the answer. So we're going to do value add in the eyes of the customer. So when you look at Lean fundamentally, it consists of three parts here. And, sorry, what's your name? Darren. Darren. So, Darren. so Darren's brand new to Lean. If we're explaining the, the basic elements of lean, there's these three components. One is eliminating waste from all of your business processes. The second one is eliminating variation, right? Any variation to your processes, which causes waste. And then the third one that lean is, is very much focused on is overburdening the employees, or rather not overburdening, overburdening your employees. So you want your employees' jobs to be easy. You want the work to come naturally and, and simply. So if you take those three things and focus on your business in those three areas, then you're basically implementing lean, right? However you want to call it. So ultimately, it is about this, though. We're in business to make money, every one of us, right? So if we're in business to make money, everything we do should drive toward that end goal, right? But it's not just making money. It's how we do it. How do we go about it? So when starting lean in an organization, we can use one of the lean tools, which is the Deming cycle or the continuous improvement cycle of plan, do, check, act. It's a very simple four-step methodology that you can use to plan virtually anything and get it done. So the first step in this is going to be the plan phase. When I start lean an organization, so I go into a company as a consultant and I say, okay, we want to become a lean organization. What does that mean? The first step that I always go to is what is our inspiration, right? Where do we look to see excellence and, and try to emulate that, right? Anytime you have a, a student with a teacher, that's a, a great learning environment. You have somebody who's already been there, done that. 
This is an example of the Volkswagen transparent factory. And this is over in Germany, and it's a gorgeous factory. It's completely clear, covered in glass, hardwood, Canadian maple floors. It's just ridiculously beautiful. When I go into a, a manufacturing factory, I have this in the back of my mind. This is my inspiration. Like, I want every factory I go to to look like that, right? Or even every hospital or wherever I'm working. This is my inspiration. So step one, when you get started with lean, go get inspired, right? So here in Utah, we have some Shingo Prize winning companies. Shingo Prize is a, a globally recognized award for operational excellence. Autoleave, OC Tanner, US Synthetic, these are companies that we can tour here in Utah to go see what excellence looks like, and they're fantastic. But if you have other companies in your area that you know are just good, right? They're just good at what you do. So for example, we also have Bullfrog Spas. We have IM Flash right up the road. These are companies that are also amazing companies to go and tour, right? So once we know what good looks like, right, then what do we do? Step number two. We've got to come up with an objective, something we want to accomplish. We've seen the vision, right? So you guys know what SMART goals are, right? I'm not going to hash that out. You know what BHAGs are, right? You know big, big hairy, audacious goals. Big, hairy, audacious goals. I don't know what SMART means, though. So okay, who definitions. wants to give them the SMART definition? Other than English. There's definition. probably five different acronyms for it out there. Who wants to round that off? Specific? Measurable. Measurable. Attainable. Attainable, achievable. For our realistic, I always think realistic and attainable are the same thing. So I always change realistic to relevant to our strategy. Is this goal relevant to what we're trying to accomplish? So that's my version of a SMART goal. And then T is for time bound, so you've got to have it done that, right? So I took those two together, and I'm making up my own term here, introducing it to you guys. It's brand new today. You guys are the first ones to hear about it. The UMG. Just basically a simplified version of both of those together, which is we have to come up with an unachievable and measurable goal. The um, this is going to go viral. It's going to be great. <laughs> Hashtag UMG. Okay. Why, why do we need an unachievable goal? Well, because you have to do something that is so hard that you can't do it doing things the way you do it today. You want people to have this response when you come up with this goal. There is no way we can do this. Right? There's no way. Which is great, because your response to that should be what? When someone says, there's no way we can do this. Want to bet? You want to bet? Yeah, that's a great response, right? Well, I was just going to say that movie, First Man, that just uh, it just went into theaters about getting to the moon. Yeah. And this, that was exactly this. There was no way. We couldn't even get things to stay up in orbit. And they had, yeah, and it, they just said, this is this one huge problem that's going to force us to solve a <coughs> bunch of little problems along the way. Exactly, it's beautiful, right? It's the moonshot. Even if we don't get to the moon, all the progress we make to get there, right? Your response to this, anytime someone says you can't do something, should be you're absolutely right. We cannot do it. We cannot do it doing things the way we do them today. We have to fundamentally change how we work, right? That's the key. So, P51 Mustang. How long do you think it takes to build a plane? Long time? Design? Put all the parts together, make all the fab all the parts, get all the different suppliers to make rubber and engines and motors and springs and oh my goodness, right? But if it's World War II and our troops are getting killed by the Germans, how long do you think it takes to make a plane then? How long from the time they place the order until they have the first prototype? Any guesses? Throw one out there. 12 months. 102 days. How long before it was in the air doing combat, like a full fleet ready to go? From the time they placed the order, said we need a plane that can keep up with the Germans. Three months. There we go. 149 days. Yes, yeah, under five wow. months. Yeah. So when the pressure's on, we humans can actually do some pretty cool stuff, right? If we have to, and that's what we're trying to do with the UMG. We're trying to do something that we have to do. We fundamentally <coughs> have to change, right? Here's some UMGs that I've had in the past: unachievable but measurable goals. Number one, never have production complain about having parts. One of my first jobs in my career, I was working at an electronics manufacturer, and they're constantly complaining about not having the parts they needed. So I said, we're going to eliminate that. We're going to get rid of it. It's never going to happen again. Never. Not once. Number two, I was working at a hospital, and the hospital had these long wait times, and they said, look, we want to make sure that even on our busiest day, no patient has to wait more than five minutes. That's hard. Like, you get busy days where they just get slammed with people. How do you do that? It's tough. And then the last one, 
Uh, this is the most recent one. So I worked at a mattress company. We'll call it the Lavender Mattress Company. <laughs> and uh, the Lavender Mattress Company said, when, when we walked in there, I mean, the place was a mess. There was machines all over and just there was no flow. And I said, look, we want this to be a $2,000 factory. What does that mean? What's a $2,000 factory? Well, if you go to Auto League, which is up here in, in Utah, and, and you go tour their factory to see why they're a shingle prize winning company, they'll charge you. $2,000 a day. Holy smokes, for me to go, go walk around their factory and see what they're doing is 2,000 bucks. Why do they have a line of people out the door to go pay 2,000 bucks to see their factory? Because they're that good. Because they're awesome and you want to see what good looks like. And you're willing to pay that money. So when I went uh, and, and started working with this mattress company, I said, this is our goal. We want to be a $2,000 factory. So that's what I'm going to use to go through the rest of this. So, there's, there's a destination of where we want to be, which is our UMG, but there's also a style, right? How do we want to get there? We can get there by being top-down, dictatorial managers and make everyone hate us and leave. Or we can go on a better path, right? We can go on a path where we bring everyone with us and we succeed as a team, right? So the style of, of lean, the journey, is the most important part. It's really not about the destination. It's about how we go toward that destination that matters, okay? So, step number three in plan. What is currently in your way? So now you're going to start using some tools. So what's stopping us from hitting that goal? And the tools you're going to use for this step is you're going to go to the value stream mapping. You're going to go to the Gembo, which means the Japanese term that means the place where the work occurs. You're going to go there. You're going to talk to the employees, talk to your team. You're going to say, why can't we go to the moon? Why can't we build an airplane in four months? Right? What's stopping us? And you're going to start making a list of all the stuff that's in your way, that the reasons why you can't. Because you're going to have people out there say, no, we can't do that. And you're saying, you're right. Tell me why. And then those become those little problems, like you said, to get to the moon. All the little problems we have to solve, right? So things you're looking for. You're looking for waste. You're looking for uncertainty. You're looking for people that are just not sure how this gets done or when it gets done or who's responsible. All that uncertainty and those waste, those are things that will slow you down. Become a $2,000 factory. What's slowing us down? Well, our appearance is no good. We need 5S. We have no visual management. That's a problem. We're not employee driven. Our employees aren't engaged and they're not making things better. These are some of the things that were slowing us down. Okay. So, step number four. Which systems and processes are going to have to change for us to get there? So now we know what's slowing us down. We know what our problems are. We've got this big elephant in front of us. We've got to break it down into bite-sized pieces. So, this is what we did over at Lavender Mattress Company. We had 5S, very important. Step one, we've got to get the factory looking better. Number two, visual management. We need KPIs that we can see, right? That people are, are tracking. We need to have team meetings. We need to have uh, huddle boards out on the floor, right? Number three, employee engagement. We need a way for employees to, to come up with ideas and give them time to actually go solve those problems. So we broke it all down, and then we said, okay, for each one of these things, we need to have a way to measure if we're going to do it and a due date. Because if we don't have a due date, it'll never get done. Due dates are one of the most powerful tools in the world. I can't tell you how many times. Problems are solved by just putting a due date out there that you can't miss. Okay. Then you've got to go look at all your stakeholders. Who's going to be impacted by this change? I want to implement lean in my company. Write down a list. Get your crew together. Write down a list of everyone who's going to be impacted and what you're going to do about that impact. Okay. So people you don't think of, like our HR department's going to be impacted, our finance department's going to be impacted, right? If you don't think about these people up front, then they're going to get in your way and they're going to slow down the progress of your, your lean culture. Okay. So, I've got probably a dozen different versions of this, and it depends on the company. But you just, you, you can make this up. It's not that difficult. But the goal is list the stakeholders, identify which ones are going to be for the change, against the change, you're neutral, how much does it impact them, do they have any background, are they, do they have the skills already, do they know what we're trying to accomplish, and then use some sort of a matrix like this to determine how you're going to communicate with that stakeholder, how you're going to bring them in so that they're on board on the journey. Remember, we're going down this road, we're on a lean journey, we want, we've want we got this, you know, Mercedes Benz, it's beautiful inside, but we've got to get people on it or we can't drive down the road, right? We're just leaving them behind, okay? Finally, step number five, okay? Finalize your plan. So we took the things that we wanted to accomplish, visual management, 5S, standard work, and we broke those down into measurable step-by-step -step items that we wanted to execute on. Okay? 
So we just we created a plan, and that's what the planning stage is all about. This was our plan. We have owners, we have due dates, right? And we have a status update. Are we making progress? Are we getting closer to the moon? And you can have a way to measure it. So if you've got your, your things you want to improve, you can measure how are we doing? Are we progressing, right? Show your results. Make that visual so people can see it. Okay, that's the planning phase. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Have any of you created a plan for your continuous improvement efforts? Anybody kind of laid it out there and then communicated it? If you haven't, then you're running ad hoc, which means you're maybe doing a lot of lean activities, but you don't have a bigger picture that you're striving for, which means you, you probably won't get to the moon if you don't know that that's where you're trying to get. Right? You might do a lot of good things, but you may not be moving the ball forward. Okay. I'm one yeah. quick question. Go Sorry, um, I, I'm kind of with Darren. I'm, you know, this is new to me. So, what is the 5S? Okay, 5S is a, obviously a way something to, to do with the parents. But. It, it's workplace organization. Ah, so basically, if there's a place for everything, everything's in its place. It's easy to find, easy to do your work. It's visual, right? Now, 5S is an acronym that stands for Sort, Set, and Order, Shine, Standardize, and Sustain. Except those are all in Japanese, which I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, the five steps of 5S are basically a way to get your workplace to be efficient and look great. Look like that transparent factory that I showed on the first slide. Yeah. 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 All right, so at the end of the planning stage, we have inspiration, a UMG, a list of obstacles, a list of broken processes that we're going to go change, and then you're going to take those and flip them into a plan. Okay, that's your, that's your planning step. Now we're going to go into do. Okay. What are we doing in the doing step? Well, this is my favorite step. This is when we get to start taking action. We get to start making things happen. So we're going to do two things. There's, there's a lot of things you could do when you're doing lean. There's a million tools out there. There's a million. You'll read books on lean, and they'll tell you to do 500 things. And it's like, oh, it's overwhelming. It's like, well, we, what do we really focus on? And um, because of that, a lot of companies will focus on the wrong thing at first, thinking that they're doing the right thing. Because it is the right thing, the timing's just off. So when you first start implementing continuous improvement in your company, you want to start with some really basic things, and I think it's really two things, okay? Training and coaching and daily huddles. That's it. That's all you want to start. Training and coaching is to get your team the skills and the tools that they need to know. Just a few, not a bunch, just a little bit of a training, right? Someone that's brand new, like Darren here, it would be just the basics, right? And then your daily huddles are going to give you a, a way to apply those tools in a team setting. Okay? So, first thing you're going to teach your employees, that everybody now has two jobs. Before, they thought they would come to work and just do their job. And that's what I got paid for. I get paid to do my job. I get paid to write, you know, web pages, or I get paid to assemble this part. You're going to teach them that they now have a second job that's equally, if not more important than their first job, which is to improve their work. How do you make it easier? How do you make the job you do faster? How do you improve the quality? Everybody in the company has to realize that they have two jobs. It's not enough to come to work anymore and just do what you're told. Okay? That's the first thing you teach them. Then you're going to teach them some more tools. You're going to teach them about the eight ways. <coughs> so if you're new to Lean, uh, the Toyota production system, which is what Lean is based off of, has seven ways. We're Americans, so we have to make everything better. So we made it eight ways which is fine, it's what continuous improvement's all about. I'm writing a book now called The Nine Ways. It's going to be up, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to go through the A Ways. The A Ways has a nice acronym, which is downtime, which is really, it makes it simple to remember, which is another reason I like it. But defects, overproduction, waiting, not using your employee's talent, transportation, inventory, motion, excess processing. There's a lot of information about that you can if you want to dive in. You've got to teach your employees to look for those things, because that's where all the improvements are going to come from. The other tool you're going to teach them is the five whys. It's a very simple tool. Um, we've got other past webinars that we've done on root cause analysis and five whys, but it's basically asking why five times until you get to the root cause of the problem. It's a very simple tool. Anyone can use it, and the trick is just to do it. If you teach your, uh, your team these three things, that their job is to improve their process, look it for the eight ways, and ask why until they get to the root cause of the problem, you're going to solve 99% of what problems you're running into. Okay, so then you have to start the improvement engine. You've trained them to the basics. How are you going to get this car flying down the road? This is where the daily huddles come in. A daily huddle is a morning stand-up meeting where your team gets together in front of a, a whiteboard <coughs> or a chalkboard or a computer screen, and you look at how you're performing. What are the metrics that you're tracking? Are you 
doing well? Are you winning or are you losing? Okay. So you're going to a meeting at that huddle board. It's a quick 10, 15 minute meeting tops. Right? Should be fast. There is no leader for this meeting. Every day the leader should be different. Some day it's the manager, the next day it's employee number one, next day it's employee number two. Everybody gets to run the meeting. And the agenda for the meeting is whatever's on the whiteboard. An example of a very basic uh, huddle board that I implemented at a hospital I was working with. And it's very, very simple. How are we doing on safety? How are we doing on staffing? Who are we recognizing today? And what is our one key metric, key, uh, KPI, key performance indicator that we really care about, which is length of stay, right? And you can see that there's nothing fancy about this. It's not hard. This is just the bare basics of what this team needs to talk about on a daily basis. And then the engine of continuous improvement is to look at that data and then go to the continuous improvement board, which is this right here. What ideas do we have? If our length of stay is too long, what ideas do we have to improve that? And then you take those ideas, prioritize them into which ones can we do now, let's start them, let's do them, and then which ones do we have done? If you have a morning meeting where you guys are talking about your KPIs and then turn those KPIs into ideas for improvement, you are doing me. You, you are crushing it. You're doing more than most companies out there are doing. I mean, this, this is the fundamental, right? And it's so easy to do. And when your employees, if you're asking them for ideas, this is a great little book. Uh, it's called Two Second Lean by this uh, crazy guy right here. Um, this is a great book, and he talks about in his book, just fix what bugs you. Fix the problems that you're having. If you're frustrated by something, if something's hard, Go work on that, right? Make that part of your improvement. There's another example of how you can do that same same board. Okay, super easy. So that's the do phase. That's all you're going to do if you're starting lean. That's all you got to do. Train your people to the basics and start doing your daily morning huddles. That's it. End of the do phase. You should have the daily huddles, the gimbal walks. Oh, you got to put some things on your calendar here. So you got to do put gimbal walks on your calendar. So gimbal walk meeting. You have a time schedule during the day where you go walk out and walk the process and talk to your team. See how they're doing. Okay? If you're a manager, if you're not a manager, right, you can you know, walk with your own team through your area. One-on-one -on -one coaching with your team, that's also very important, right? You've got to have that at least once a month where you're meeting with your team and asking them how they're doing and, and what we can do better. And then training of the month, this is something that I've used in every company I've worked with. Is we pick one topic every month to train on, one of the eight ways or five S. And we just train to that topic all month long. Okay? That's the only thing we talk about, and we focus all of our continuous improvement efforts on that one topic. That's the do phase. Any questions on the do phase? Does the team seem too simple to be true? Because it is. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, well, we have a, a common pitfalls and mistakes that companies make at the end of the presentation. But I'll dive into one thing right now. One thing that companies do, and as a consultant, I should be telling you this because I'm, I'm throwing all my fellow consultants under the bus. What you should not do is go say, hey, we're going to do a lean program. Let's go hire a consultant or let's go get all of our team trained as black belts, which is a Six Sigma training level, right? And it's an enormous cost to the company, and it teaches them every tool in the book. And at the end of that training, you will have actually accomplished nothing for your team, right? It, unless it's a really good training, which I rarely see, where they actually are doing good projects and getting good results. But it takes a long time. You will get more value out of getting your people to do daily huddles and solve small problems on a regular basis. And then when they're ready, there is a time and a place for graduating to more of the tools and getting a more robust program, but it's not step one. And unfortunately, it's what a lot of companies do is step one because they don't know what else to do. So like, well, let's just go train a bunch of people. And, and then it, it just, I've seen it over and over again, it doesn't work, right? Now we're gonna go into check. Check phase is really easy. This is where in the plan to check act cycle, you are basically validating whether the work you're doing so far is actually working, okay? And the way you do that is by looking at your metrics, your KPIs, whatever you're trying to track. In the emergency department at this hospital, it was length of stay, right? Are we seeing an improvement in our length of stay? We've been working on all these fixes. The other thing you want to measure during the check phase is employee engagement. Are we getting our <coughs> members engaged? Are we starting to get people on board with this idea of constantly improving their processes? Right? So one of the ways you can do that in, uh, in KPI Fire, this is a screenshot from that software where you can say, look, how many uh, ideas do we have being entered every month? Is that picking up? And 
How many of those ideas are being actually turned into uh, projects and being solved, being turned into solutions? Right? So that's a way you can measure whether your employees are engaged, in addition to just going and talking to them and getting a sense for how things are going. Right? That's always the right answer. Go talk to your people. Yes? Travis, uh, one thing we had to do when we did the green belt training is we actually had to run a Kaizen for a space project. Perfect. Yeah, so what Travis is talking about is a, a proper way to do a, a, a Lean Six Sigma green belt training, which is as part of the training, they have to lead a project and actually show some tangible results, I'm imagining, for, for Travis there. And, and that's exactly right. When you do decide to get people trained, there should be tangible benefit that you expect to come out of that training, right? Um, but the, the failure mode, again, is if you train them and then they come back to work and there isn't a routine of continuous improvement, there is no daily huddle, there's no monthly accountability to getting something done, making progress, then all of that training goes to waste because you have all the skills, but you don't have a rhythm that you're in. So your job is to create the rhythm. You have to create the regular routine for continuous improvement. Every day we have a meeting. Every week we re review our projects. Every month we have a monthly report out on our, our progress. If you don't have those rhythms in place, then training the people doesn't really get you Yes. Um, you, have, you have all these goals, and you're tracking it, and you're encouraging employees. Are you? Do you suggest like incentivizing this, or just saying these are our goals and it's fun to do? Yes. No, I do suggest that. In fact, that's part of the next session, so we will get to that. You're way ahead of me. Yeah, absolutely. So you do have to uh, what we call pour some fuel on the fire. It's working. So we'll, we'll do that. So end of the due stage. Review your KPIs weekly. Review your engagement weekly, so at least once a week you're checking in on your progress. It's that simple, right? So, okay, last step, act, or also sometimes called adjust, right? So, it's working, it's working, I think that's from a Star Wars movie. If, if you've got something that's working, like you said, uh, great, right? We're seeing improvement, employees are getting engaged. This hospital I worked with, they're out in um, Tooele County, and uh, the one I've been mentioning, and I brought these tools to them. I introduced the daily huddle, the, the KPI that they're tracking, the idea board, the idea engine, and they just ran with it. They like, like no company I've ever seen. They just got excited about it. They're like, yeah, we're gonna do it. And I came back a week later, and sure enough, they got, you know, they got all these ideas, and they're working on them, and they were excited to show me what they've done. And I'm like, man, these guys, they, they get it, right? They're just going for it. And, and so all I had to do with them was just give them more to do. Say, okay, let's set some higher goals. Let's make some more progress. And they did, they ran with it. Right, so it's really cool. Um, if it is working, reward behavior. You can throw parties. I throw out $5 gift cards like crazy. That's an easy one to do. But giving people verbal recognition in their team, one-on-one, -on -one, that goes a long way. People, people want to be told thank you. You come to work every day to be told thank you for doing a good job. That helps. A lot of people discount the monetary side too, but I tell you, people also love a $5 gift card. You know what's funny is doctors make a lot of money, but you will never see more competition than when you offer a doctor a $5 Starbucks gift card if they can accomplish something. They will fight each other for it. They, they will go to great lengths to be the winner of that $5 Starbucks gift card. So don't discount that, it, it matters, right? You can add more areas to your continuous improvement system with some of the areas are going well, and you can promote the wins through the organization through email, phone calls, presentations, right? Get the word out, let people know, hey, we got something good going here. We're, we're making progress, our team is engaged, right? You gotta, you gotta be a salesman to do continuous improvement and get it into the culture of the company. You have to consistently sell, um, and there's nothing wrong with selling. Right? There's nothing wrong, a lot of us, especially if you're in you know, the production environments and, and you're kind of a, a you know, middle manager type people, we're not usually the ones to boast. We're not the kind of people to raise our hands and say, look what we did over here, it's amazing. Right? That's not our style, and it's hard. It's something that you kind of have to learn that it's okay and it's actually better for the company if you share all the good work you're doing because it gets other people excited. Or if they're the type of personality that's just competitive, they'll be like, oh, why are those guys doing more than we are? And then they're gonna get excited and go you know, try to meet you. Great, right? Whatever motivates them, that's awesome. But you can't uh, you know, hide your light under a bushel, as it said. You've gotta tell people about it, right? So, how do you form a habit? So this is the three R's of habit change by James Clear, and it says, one, there's got to be a reminder, which is what we call a trigger. Then there's got to be a routine, which I talked about, and then there's got to be a reward. This is how you form a habit. So what's your trigger? 
Your trigger is every time, every morning you have a daily huddle. That's, that's a trigger, and it turns into a routine. The trigger is any time you miss your KPI. If, you, if your length of stay or your manufacturing cycle time, whatever you're tracking, if you miss it, that's your trigger to take action. You've got to do something. Your routine is your daily huddle agenda where you're going through those metrics and you're going through the, the continuous improvement engine, right? And then the third step is the reward. You have to reinforce good behavior with your employees. If you fail to reward, why are they going to continue to go through the routine? Right? Unless you like dictate it, you have to do it because it's your job and otherwise you don't have a job. And again, that's a style thing. We don't want to go down the lean path with that style. It's just not cool. It's not fun. We want to make it fun. Okay. If it's not working, Sandro, we tried it. We did our daily huddles. We taught everybody about 5S. They rejected it. They said they don't like it. And they want to go do Six Sigma and get Black Belt training. Um, don't overreact. Be patient. Wait. See if you can uh, continue to reinforce the routine. You know, they say it takes 30 days to make a habit. I don't know if it's 30 days, 60 days. There's some number out there. 68 of statistics are made up on the spot. So <laughs> it takes some amount of time to get your people into the routine. And you've got to do that long enough for it to stick, right? So stick with it. Don't give up. If you still don't see results after a couple months, right? Use the five whys. Why are we seeing results? What's going on? Are we fixing the pain of the team? Let me give you another example. At the uh, Lavender Mattress Company, I wanted to uh, make a pretty significant change to a process on the line. And I was going to go out and talk to the employees about that process and ask them to maybe help me make that change. Before I did that, I knew that they were going to rebel and not like it. I, I was positive about it. I just knew they wouldn't. So instead what I did is I went out and I talked to those employees and I said, hey, what is bugging you about this line? And you know what they told me? Every day I show up and my scissors are missing. My scissors are never there. They're always gone. The other shift walks off with my scissors. My scissors gone. My tape measure's gone. I don't have my gloves. I said, great. Let's fix that problem. So we made got a little cardboard thing, and we put some scissors in the cardboard thing so that they had a standard place for the scissors, a standard place for the tape measure, and everybody got trained on how to leave the stuff where it's at and not go home with it at night. You know? And we fixed that problem for us. So when they walked into work, they had their scissors, right, which is what they wanted. And then I went back and asked them for the other change. And you know what? They didn't say a word. They're like, oh, yeah, we, we fixed the scissor problem. That was easy. What do you want us to do next? Great. Let's, let's go do that. I won them over because I solved the problem they wanted to solve first. And then I could help solve the bigger picture problem. That's a fantastic technique you can use to trick your employees. <laughs> okay. Go help them first. It's crazy. It's called service leadership. And if you, if you don't know what service leadership is, it's a fantastic way to trick your employees by caring about them. It's terrible, Heather. It's absolutely terrible. Okay. Watch for detractors. There's going to be people that don't want to change or struggle with it. You've got to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and then immediately fire them. <laughs> you want to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and find out why. These, these people, honestly, you can turn these people. Right? These people are the people that are going to fight you, and you can turn them. And when you turn them, they have energy. They've got energy. If they're fighting you, it's because they have energy. They're passionate about something. They're passionate about, hey, whatever you're telling me to do is wrong, and there's a reason they think that. If you can find out what that is, you can get them to be on your side. And when they're on your side, those people are your strongest advocates, and they will change. These aren't often your formal leaders. These are often your informal leaders, the people that are kind of doing things behind the scenes. Um, find out who those people are. Then they meet with them. Get them on your side. Um, end of the act stage, we should have a reward and recognition program going on to reinforce the positive behaviors. We should refine our CF continuous improvement process. That's what CI stands for. Um, and then if we're not, it's not working, we're going to switch the focus, and we may even train to some new tools that maybe match the problems we're seeing. Like if changeover is a big problem in your in your factory, and we're not, you know, we may need to train people for that specific tool set, how to do SMED or quick changeover, right? We may need to do that. Here's what we're going to talk about next. What can you do to screw this all up? Because it's going to work. If you do what I just explained to you, if you follow those same plan to check act steps, it will work. I promise. I've done it over and over and over again. <coughs> but... Why are all these wildebeest just charging headfirst into the waters as fast as they freaking can? Doesn't that just seem odd? There must be a strategy though, right? Or, or they've just been bred for millions of years to be crazy animals. 
No, there's a strategy, right? But a lot of times you can head straight into something at full speed because you're all excited and not realize that there's danger ahead, right? There's something in the water, right? And I guess they're hoping if they run fast enough, they'll not be the one getting caught. It's just sheer statistics, right? These guys are statisticians, right? <laughs> right. If there's 5,000 of us in the water, there's two alligators, then my odds are this, but if you go one at a time, my odds are, yeah, these guys are, they, they got a lot more going on upstairs than you think. So, so they know what they're doing. I'm going to give you some uh, examples of mistakes you can make. Analysis paralysis. You can think way too much about what's going on in your problem to get stuck on it, right? Um, yeah. Things that cause analysis for now the process. Wanting more data. I need more data. I can't make a decision until I get this data and that data and this data. I need more data. What else? What else causes analysis paralysis? Yes, better charts. Perfection, right? You want perfection. Like, this is good, but I want it to be even better, right? That can slow you down. I own a software company, so believe me, I know all about that. I'm like, it really hurts. Sometimes you have to release a, a feature that is not, like, as perfect as you want it, but, you, you know, it's going to take three more months and customers are waiting and it's like, it, it's painful. But if you don't act, it's more painful. Travis says that's what that was me during my green belt project. Just don't let perfection keep you from very good. Thank you, Travis. Don't let perfection keep you from very good. That's excellent. All right. So uh, wanting more options. Hey, give me more options. Yeah, I've got you know you come to the boss and say hey, we got these two options. Oh, I need more options. I I had a boss that that was like a favorite tagline of this. Right? These are all quotes. From him. Uh, give me more options. Uh, worried it wouldn't work. There's a lot of people that are afraid of screwing stuff up. Let me tell you what. You can change a process. And I can promise you it will not be perfect. Unless you are God and you have decided that this, this is the way to do it. It will be wrong. It will not be perfect. Who cares? Even if you fail, right? What did Edison teach us? Right? Or Tesla, if you want to really argue about who invented the light bulb. Let's be serious. And we all know Edison was just a businessman and Tesla invented it. So, when, when he invented the light bulb, right, he made a lot of mistakes, right? Um, but he learned from everyone. So that's a, it's a learning experience. Um, I'm worried other people will criticize what I'm doing. My answer to that is the Dunn Manifesto. If you haven't read the Dunn Manifesto, go find it. And it basically says, you know, those that are, have dirty hands are doing the work are right. So you can respond to people and say, I like the way I'm doing it a lot better than I like the way you're not doing it. So, um, <laughs> 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 Small changes for the better. There we go. Lean is small changes for the better. Let me tell you about uh, what my experience with uh, the mattress company, and we had to relay out a line. We spent months with <coughs> weekly meetings to go from this to that. Months. <laughs> Painful, yes. Why? We need more options. Give me more data. I, I need more. It's not perfect. It, that, 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 there's lots of reasons. The minute we, we put those two lines together, we saved thousands and thousands of dollars. And we could have been saving that for months ahead of time. But there was analysis paralysis. Okay. So, overcoming the ability to act. What stops our actions? Things we just talked about. What can we do about it? Get our data quickly. Gather data. Use that data to go with it. Pick the best option. Just pick one and run, right? You can learn. Um, remember the doers are always right. And also remember that doers are always right. <laughs> the demi cycle, uh, the act and do parts, these are action steps. Half of the demi cycle is action, not planning. <coughs> right? So remember that. Remember to do action. Okay. Mistake number two. I you need top level support. To implement lean at my company and we're just not successful because darn it my senior, senior managers and my CEO, CEO they just, just don't CEO get it don't get it let me tell you guys I have worked for a lot of CEOs that don't get it and I've learned worked for vice presidents of operations and they don't get it so what are they stopping you from doing what you know to do are they stopping you from having a daily huddle are they stopping you from getting ideas from your team and making those changes are they really physically stopping you? Because if they're not, that is not an excuse. Who cares? Go do it without them. The Best Buy employees, I don't know when this was, 10 years ago, I don't remember when the story was. I'm dating myself a little bit, but they wanted to work from home. And instead of asking permission, they thought, you know, we're not productive driving to work every day. Everything we do is on a computer by ourselves. So they had this customer service team, and they decided, oh, we're just going to start working from home. And they did. 
<laughs> and uh, they were working from their cabin up in the woods, and they were working all over, and then this became a thing, and all of a sudden all these people were doing it, and they were way more productive. All their metrics went up. And by the time the senior management found out, it was too late to do anything about it, so they publicized it like it was a win, and they thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would suggest doing that for Lean. Just go do it, and then when you prove how amazing successful it is, then your managers will take credit for it, and it'll be fine. <laughs> Okay. Tool focus. What's the purpose of creating a culture of lean? Uh, basically, <laughs> just to make money. That's what we're in the process of doing here, kids. So um, we can spend months value stream mapping. That's not going to make us any money. We can spend months creating control charts doing Six Sigma. Well, that's not going to make us any money. Does that mean these things are bad? I mean, we shouldn't do them. Oh, we should. We should do them, but we should do them fast. We should do them lean, right? Months training black belts. What can we do? We can fix problems and make money with short-term goals. Okay, really quick. Like Travis said, small wins, small little kaizens. Okay. Um, I went to Rwanda, and if you've been to one of my webinars, you know I talk about it a lot because I love Rwanda. It's my favorite place in the world. If you're going to go on one vacation in the year in your life, go to Rwanda. It is there's no place on earth that's that's more amazing. Um, and I've been a lot of places. They had a genocide in 1994, and uh, 800,000 people. So those two things don't go together in my world. I'm sorry. I, I know, and, but this is why people remember. But if you want to talk about having a big problem, they've got a big problem. They had a massive slaughter in their country where two tribes of people that weren't even two tribes until the French told them they were two tribes went and started killing each other and, and massive destruction. It was amazing. How do you overcome that as a country when your neighbor killed your dad? That's a big problem. We think we have big problems. We don't have big problems. Let me tell you, they have big problems. How do they overcome that? How do they eat that elephant? Okay. Well, they do really small things. They set up a routine of togetherness, of service, of help. This is called the Umaganda. And on Saturday, you are required to meet with your village and you go out and you clean the streets and you set up gardens and you do service together. And that's how you heal a country that has gone through something as atrocious as what Rwanda went through. And if you go to Rwanda today, this small little Saturday activity where for an hour or so they're required to go meet as a, as a family, as a community, and, and do something together, something small like picking up garbage, it is moving them toward healing as a country and, and becoming something that they weren't before. Very small steps like this. They didn't like plastic bags because they were uh, there was too much plastic garbage on the road. So you know what the president of the country did? He got a lot of plastic bags. There's no plastic bags. You go to the streets of Rwanda. It is the prettiest country you'll ever see. There is no garbage anywhere. It's gorgeous, right? Small things lead to big change, big results. Okay. Solution: Take your ideas. All the ideas your employees gave you. Put them in a priority matrix. This is like an effort impact matrix, right? You could say, okay, which of these projects are going to give us the highest impact with the lowest effort? Let's go do them. Let's go knock them out. Okay. Not measuring. It's another big mistake. But if you don't measure if you're winning or losing, then uh, you don't know if you're successful. Your team doesn't know if they're successful, which takes away a motivation. If they see they're successful, they're going to be motivated to do more. Uh, it really does. It snowballs. When your team feels success, They'll breed, breeds more success. I had a, a company I was working on elect, when they, uh, one of the stories from my electronic manufacturing days when we had a goal that we wanted to hit, which was like a certain number of units per hour, but they weren't even close. So we set the goal to what they could do, which was like 40 units an hour. And you know what? They could hit that goal, and they got used to hitting that goal, and it was great. And so then we lowered it, and then we lowered it some more, and they just got used to winning. And pretty soon they won all the time until we got to the point where we were hitting the goal we wanted, and they were hitting the goal, and, and everyone was happy because they got used to winning. But you got to know what winning means. Okay? Not rewarding. To your point, we got to reward. We've got to give people gift cards. We've got to tell them thank you. We, if we don't actually encourage the behavior, then there's no incentive to do the behavior. Right? You can try threatening them. You know, you can try the carrot and the stick. Right? The carrot's more fun. I would use the carrot. Okay. All right. That's it. Those are the top five mistakes. So uh, that's it. That, that's the whole presentation for today. And remember, it's about the journey. It's about how we get there. It's about the style of where we're going. 
not just uh, the destination.